Hey, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the People of Private Capital podcast with me, Ferdy Roberts. I'm the CEO and founder of Asset Class. We're a provider of software solutions to the front, middle, and back office divisions of private equity companies, venture capital companies, essentially any company that's involved in taking offerings, private offerings, to the broader market. Today, I'm speaking with J.B. Tonkeray, Jean-Bernard Tonkeray, who's the CEO and founder of Dorian. Dorian is focused on providing solutions to non-European fund managers or general partners who want to address the European LP base. Uh, for anybody who's ever tried to provide a fund offering in the European sector, you'll understand that there's a lot of complexity to it. There are country-specific rules, there's passporting requirements, there's solicitation challenges that come with entering that market. JB takes some time to demystify some of that, talk about his entrepreneurial journey, having moved from France, from Brittany to London in the late 90s, right through his experience uh, becoming a CIO of a family office, moving then into the entrepreneurial world himself, uh, providing software solutions to the family office space, and then more recently, his launch of Dorian, which, as I say, is focused on making it easier to get your funds in front of a European LP base. It's a great conversation. JB is a great conversationalist, brings a bit of French flair to the conversation. Uh, hope you enjoy it. And with that, let's introduce JB Tonkere from Dorian here on the People of Private Capital podcast. Great. Well, first of all, JB, thanks very much for joining us here on the People Thank of you. Private Capital. Um, it's uh, it's a pleasure to have you here. It's nice to bring a bit of European flavor uh, to to the podcast, and so we're we're stepping up our game here, bringing uh, a Frenchman to talk about uh, bringing funds to Europe. And um, as I mentioned in the introduction, there you've got um, quite an interesting background, a pretty varied background, um, both as a founder um, and as an entrepreneur. Uh, but also, given your CIO experience in the family office space, um, I think it's a really interesting mix of skills. And so I'd like to explore a little bit of that. But uh, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Great. Thank so, you JB, uh, I, I, I was interested. We obviously had a chance to talk uh, on a number of different occasions. Uh, first of all, I should say probably a disclaimer here. You are a client of ours. Uh, we're delighted to have you as a client. Um and uh, look forward to expanding our relationship over time. Um, but I, I think what you're doing right now with uh, with Dorian, um, which we'll dive into over the course of the podcast, is really timely um, as the markets start to pick back up and uh, we see a little bit more activity, a lot more activity here stateside, uh, certainly. But I, I'm interested, just before we kind of dive into your background, um, to to understand a little bit about the markets in Europe right now. I mean, how, how do you feel, let's say, the broader private capital markets in Europe are in Europe right now um, across VC, private equity and, and the like? Yeah, sure. So what I did notice is that um, when it comes to private investors, family office like investors, over the last 18 months, the, the market, things get really quiet, got really yeah. quiet. Uh, with a fear as to understand when it is a good or bad time to get involved again and reallocate. Um, and that's especially true when mul many multifamily offices tend to be more trend followers than trend setters. So they will wait for anyone to jump on board, for them to jump on board. And therefore, you can see a real lag here. When you look on corporate investing, uh, corporate venture funds or um, or, 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 or um, direct investing in startups and, or other businesses, it's remained active. You can see that. You can see, like, yeah. I've been I worked on, on, on you know, clean tech deals, car manufacturers, uh, equipment, you know, electric equipment manufacturers get really, really involved. Um, it has a business or through the corporate venture fund that I see a persistency. Uh, activity remains uh, here because it's here to respond to industrial visions and things like that, therefore they, they remain active. The strict passive financial investors is much slower and got quieter, but I think mm -hmm. seems to be picking up again in the US. Um, with a three to six months lag with the UK and the rest of Europe. And I, mm -hmm. I guess H2, and I do believe, uh, half of this year should be 
more interesting, more dynamic, more open-minded about deal opportunities, um, you know, across the whole arts uh, scope. Today, what remains active, and you can see that is um, secondary funds allocation. Mm -hmm. you know, there's been, been fund in France, we raised half a billion on secondary deals. Um, the ex CEO of our, um, one of the ex, you know, managing partners of Ardian launched nearly a billion plus secondary fund. There you see European money very active, very active there. Yeah, yeah. So it, it's, um, it's fair to say that it lags somewhat behind the US, but it, but maybe, you know, three to six months. Is that kind of the feeling that you're, you're getting That's right my now? Feeling. Of yeah. course, we've got two uncertainty that remains very, um, uh, you know, worrying. The first one is what's going to happen when, with Ukraine. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a perceived sense of contamination here. And the second thing is also what's happening in the Middle East, because you could yeah. see what happened in the Middle East, a uh, repercussion in Europe. You know, lots of countries going to uh, to vote this year, at least in European election. Uh, the, the expectation that extreme parties, extreme left, extreme right, going to yep. gain ground, that is going to create, you know, what, what do they really mean as a, as a new balance? Um, the US going to vote again, uh, elect a new president. So that remains, let's say, uh, contextual certainties that may slow down my prediction or not, depending on whether we had a good surprise on, on, on economics and on politics and things, things tends to normalize. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so it's, yeah, it's interesting. We'll, we'll perhaps dive into some of the local, um, well, we'll certainly be talking about some of the local peculiarities of um, engaging with LPs in the European theater um, in a moment. But if I can maybe take you back a little bit, just so people understand a little bit more about, um, about you as an individual and your background. Um, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm here in New York. I'm a, um, to paraphrase a, a Sting song, an Irishman in New York. You're a Frenchman in the UK. Um, uh, just uh, uh, give us a little bit of background as to how did you, uh, first of all, why did you leave uh, you know, uh, such a beautiful country with all of your culture and architecture and food and wine? And not that the UK or London particularly is bad. I spent 16, 17 years there myself. I loved it. Um, but how did you end up there and, um, you know, what, what was the kind of genesis of, of that move? Well, I think, first of all, I'm a country Frenchman. I mean, in the age of seven, I wanted to work and live in London. My family's uh, on, the, on my father's side is Huguenot, Paris British then. And right. I've been going to the UK, uh, spending holiday in the UK, I, yeah, since my, you know, um, seven, eight years old, since I was seven or eight, the basically got very much exposed to the UK and I met me, I would say, a, a Frenchman of British adoption. Right. Um, and, and you know, yeah, I love genealogy and genetics and they do have, you know, family roots. The Tankerays are actually, originally speaking, uh, from Scotland. Right. And right. I, oh, yeah, yeah, I'm go, go, going to Normandy with the Vikings. And became, you know, what they call Norman and back to the UK uh, for uh, religious reason. On my mother's side is from Brittany, the, you know, the Celtic speaking part of France, right. very close to Ireland. So we've always looked across the channel of the natural space for evolution. Yeah. You know, very and good. the tradition of this, you know, multi secular trade route that's been spanning the, uh, the, the English Channel and the uh, Irish Sea and yeah. the Celtic Sea, uh, yeah. between northwestern France and, and the British Isles. And I don't. So, yeah, so that's what's sort of a natural part of evolution. And you'd be very surprised to see that many people in Brittany, uh, when we had freedom of movement between France and the UK uh, pre Brexit, would hesitate do I go to Paris or do I go to London, basically? Mm. Right, right. And, and back in the mid 90s, sorry, sorry, <laughs> but, but, yeah. talking, but back in the mid 90s, you know, when the men in Europe uh, was under, you know, um, economic stress because of the high uh, interest rates in Germany, post reunification, it would take you ages to get a job in Paris, you know, uh, months, month and a half. In London, you can get a job as a, you know, risk manager at Citibank, which happened to me in 10 days. So there was no wow. hesitation. So, you, so you, 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 you came across to London and within a couple of weeks you were working at Citibank. And this, yes. this of course, was pre-Brexit. There was, uh, you know, free movement of, of, uh, of, of labor. And, yeah, 
the night yeah. is the single market, you know, single act generations or the Eurostar generations. Yeah. Right. And that, that's, uh, that was an interesting, I was in London myself at the time. It was a very interesting time to be in London, very high energy. I mean, you had, um, you know, the growth of internet stocks, you had, yeah. um, you know, it was a very bullish environment to be in. And I think you could probably still feel the reverberations of Thatcher's Britain because it was such a high growth phase. And uh, well, I guess a combination of Thatcherism and Reaganism, uh, which was get out there and create your own opportunities for yourself. It was, uh, you know, the backdrop of the, the Berlin, the fall of the Berlin wall and everything was possible. Uh, right. I mean, it was a very interesting yeah, yeah, yeah. time to be in Europe. Yeah, and there was this book from Fukuyama, The Hand of History. I mean, we thought it'd be, you know, peaceful for generations to go. Yeah, yeah. And so you, you joined City um, uh, in, in London. And how did your career progress from there? Um, I mean, you've you got a, quite a, a varied, um, varied uh, roles, you know, between then, which I guess was kind of 97-ish. Is that right? Yeah. 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 Um, so just kind of talk us through a quick potted history to bring us up to date um, with, with where you are now. Yeah, so um, so basically, so starting my career at 97, Citibank, then I, I joined a future ratings uh, to rate asset managers. Okay. Uh, this was actually based in Paris and I had to spend a bit more time in France to get closer to my parents because my father had a health issue and uh, we needed support um, our, our mum and dad. And yep. then from that, I became, you know, um, a front of a hedge fund portfolio manager at 40 investments. So I got back to London, became an independent consultant um, in terms of manager selections. I had a French company hire and retain um, a US equity fund managers, I had help a major asset managers improve their investment processes, basically uh, replicating what I learned at 40s, uh, no, fit rating, sorry, and, 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 and implement that. Uh, like I said, I got Paramount for this investment where I set all of the uh, evolving into a fund of hedge fund managers. And that took me uh, as a hedge fund, you know, uh, head of hedge fund selection role at a multifamily office in London. Um, right. And that's how I, I, I stepped into the family office work, ending up you know, as a CIO of a single family office within Paris and London. Yeah. And so, um, you know, one of the things that strikes me about, about family offices, and, uh, you know, I speak to, quite a few of them, more so in the US, uh, less so in Europe. But it seems to me like, uh, it, it, was it a single family office or multifamily? So uh, single, I, I moved okay. from multi to single, yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so particularly with single family offices, um, I'm interested in your experience there, you know, the good and the bad. I mean, what I've heard is, I mean, you, you can obviously, um, you know, move reasonably quickly because you're in control of your destiny as a single family office. Um, but at the same time, you've got this family, <laughs> which is yeah. mixed up in all of the decision making and um, I guess the governance associated with that. H how did you find that? How did that experience uh, kind of um, influence you as a, as a person and, 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 and perhaps give you some insight into what you wanted to do next? Yeah, I know it's a, it's a big question asking here. So, uh, and I cannot hide be, behind Chatham House rule, right? right. Uh, <laughs> uh, what I'm seeing here is going to stay and, and be public. So, yeah. you know, when I moved from the institutional asset management world into the uh, family office world, world uh, especially with the multifamily office one, uh, was the uh, back then, it was really... Um, you didn't have this energy to grow a business. It was, you know, you were living on existing wealth. Uh, there was no process. Um, seeing when not they were constructed, uh, decisions processing, you know, decision making processes could sometimes look erratic. It was more about the relationship that the head of the family office had with the principal. This is what mattered. Uh, the right. central element. Uh, of all that is a relationship you have an influential um, skill you, you have and, and develop with your principal, uh, which when you come from you know the institutional 
asset management world where you benchmark, where you need to grow assets, when you become, you've got to be a bit salesy uh, and grow as any business. Um, initially, family offices were not subject to that. So it was really yeah. a bad relationship and they didn't really need to grow. And, and I really questioned the ability of a family office to actually grow because even, you know, um, 15 years later, with all the SaaS and platform things that we have today, I think the quality of a family office relies on um, the, 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 the manager's ability to keep and grow a relationship with few principles. Everyone's very unique, they're covering um, specific needs, although the high commonality in many needs, uh, the psychology, all this is very different. It's extremely different and plays a role, emotions are very important. Um, yeah. Keeping the family united is very important, and and and, and yes, uh, money magnifies problem. On one hand, it's great you can, you can do a lot of things, and a lot of things you don't need to worry about. But there's a whole new spectrum of things to worry yeah. about. You know, governance, a, you know, visibility, how to keep the family united, how do you keep you know, you, you know parasites away from family, and all these kind of yeah. things. And and since lots of emotion decisions are made on emotions, and how do you rationalize all that in, in a way that speak and, and works for everybody. So that's a real big difference that I learned. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. I, I think that's the reason why lots of multifamily offices are managed by private bankers, because they're very key like that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I've heard an expression in the past, I think it's, um, it's uh, you know, from shirt sleeves to shirt sleeves over three generations. You know, the first yeah. generation works hard, you know, rolls up its sleeves to, to make the money. The second generation, you know, spends the money and the third generation has to rebuild. And that's, yeah, I guess, that's what, every, true. what every family office is trying to avoid is to create that multi-generational uh, wealth. Um, it, it is, it is a challenge. Um, but uh you, you you worked in that space for for quite some time, right? Um, yeah. So this was from the 2010s onwards, was it? Uh, 2007 right? to 2018. Right? Okay. Yeah. Yep. A whole okay. decade. But but I agree with you on three things. But I could say there's two things. Um, so so on one hand, you know, it's a very difficult market because wealthy people, you know, I used to have everything the way they needed to. Okay. Yeah. And uh, lots of people will be keen to respond to the needs because uh, you know, they're effectively they're the client, they're the boss. So basically, yep. and they can you know, sh um, decide how they want, how they want, when they want. Nonetheless, I believe that family offices need to play a stronger role at educating family, just mm -hmm. to avoid the short sleeve to short sleeve um, phenomenon. And families will maintain wealth throughout multiple generations, like the Rockefeller among themselves. And to me, the one, all uh, um, families like the, the Peugeot in France, the Michelin in France, they've always yeah. treated money as a business and as a duty, not as a privilege. And that made a completely difference because they view the money as something they need to keep growing. So it's not yeah. a matter of preserving wealth, it's a matter of making sure that wealth serves the economy of today and tomorrow. Yeah, yeah. And that is a massive difference. It how wealth is viewed, and I don't want to sound like a fresh revolutionary thing that, but how money is viewed as a social duty. Yeah. And therefore yeah. the business. And that's a, that's a big difference. Yeah. And um, I know uh, just for, from our previous conversations, uh, you, 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 you get, you've got a... a uh, significant family yourself, right? There's seven of you, I think, in total, um, including yeah, yourself. Yeah, my wife. Yeah, okay, seven, yeah. including me. Yeah, we've got five kids. Um, and uh, did that? Um, I guess depending on when those, uh, when your when your kids are born, um, did that help you? Uh, you know, understand the dynamic a little bit more of the the family office, just um, having a large family yourself. <laughs> Uh, well, certainly, and that's why, you know, with the last family office I worked full time before I wanted to jump back into the um, entrepreneurial adrenaline. Yeah. Uh, the fact that we were raising families at the same time with kids of similar age did get us much closer together. And today yeah. we have a, a, a truly friendly um, relationship. Um, yeah. There's clearly um, a, a strong connection here. 
and yeah, yeah exactly. Uh, and yes, I've got four daughters, one son, and I can see how each one is very different from one another. Yeah. And how a family, you know, dynamics change. If one is here, the other one's not here. And, and I don't know, parents, we have to keep this little crowd together. Yeah. 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 Very well, my good. wife so is a psychologist by education, so we're pretty lucky here. All right. Okay. Well, that helps. <laughs> um, well, you know, what, what, what's interesting when I look at your background is, um, you know, that evolution. And I wonder, because, you, you know, you've spent the time since then really as an entrepreneur and founder. And I wonder if um, your time as a chief uh, investment officer, whether that did that encourage you and expose you a lot more to the entrepreneurial mindset? Um, why did you make that move from, you know, from, from investing to becoming, I guess, the vehicle for investment, right? As in founding your own, uh, your own companies and maybe give us a little bit of background on how that entrepreneurial journey started, um, for you with, with Finlight and now with Dorian, um, mm -hmm. and, and the markets that you address just for our audience to gain an appreciation of that. Yeah, and I and I think one of the, the, the main things that really pushed me into that direction is I, I am, has been an entrepreneur in my family, so being an independent was something, you know, always well there in the background. Mm -hmm. uh, my father had a legal business, a law business, and um, my and my grandfather on, on my mother, my mother's father basically uh, had a horse breeding business. And right. so, you know, there was always a bit of ID and or, or, you know, having a business. You know, You've always had that business. entrepreneurial... Um, yeah, the, the need to build a business. You know, yeah. and there's a lot mm -hmm. of people who say it's in, in, in a man's life, you need uh, to build a wall, uh, you know. And, and and I think me, my wall was to build a business, basically. Yeah. Trying and build a business, trying to do something about it. Um, yeah. And, and as a family officer, um, I came across lots of entrepreneurs. I found their life fascinating. The credibility, the motivation, and yeah, the reasons that was really something I, uh, I wanted to try. I, I could not avoid, and that's how I jumped. And um, still advising that family office since 2018, I developed sort of. First of all, it was a company called Strip Your Banker, which was to create a sort of uh, self-serve family office, having a sort of corporate construction software um online and lots of family offices uh friends of mine came back to can we use that and where we realized they had a massive data problem and so we developed finite technology that you know using natural language processing to read financial documents and restructure the information and and get that ready for them to uh, consolidate a complex portfolio more rapidly i think and it would that, have worked was... better that was focused on the family office um yeah sector. yeah family yeah. office and, and and the vision was uh, uh on the self-serve basis and i think it would have worked better if we had uh positioned ourselves as a bpo uh being a business process out of yeah. service would have been much better and and but but but, but that also was keeping me away from also my uh, exploiting my uh, investment background and what I learned from investing. And this real way is, uh, uh, I left in like really large Dorian uh, to sort of reconnect the bridge between LP and GP within this ever complex regulatory environment we're in and, and, and how you, you know, you have the freedom to choose and, and remove or uh, remove might not be the right verb, but make sure that this barrier that here to, create, to protect, I don't think they get yeah. off wrong, barrier and then not by definition bad they also hate to play the whole disparity that meant to protect you doesn't play against you and 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 and, and ability to return the freedom to choose and, and to allocate your capital where you we you need to and vice versa yeah so so that brings us up to to date which is where where, where you are now as the founder um and ceo of dorian mm -hmm. um and so for people who are listening that's d-o-r-h-y-a-n dot yeah. eu if, you, if they, you want to find out some additional details um and so dorian um what what's the thesis behind dorian um who are you who are you trying to attract as potential clients for um for for dorian yeah so typically so first of all financial services is a sector that embrace um embraces innovation wins 
got to do it really usually it's a compliant thing okay yeah and and because compliance create a, a friction so how do you remove that friction so that was the first challenge and my clients my target clients is really um non-european gps wanted to get into europe you know and also helping european gps go beyond europe and i right. think we need this sort of uh, investors need to need portfolio diversification, i.e. geographic diversification, GEP diversification. They also need a, a broader international network to support the portfolio companies. So yeah. you, they need to have GPs from everywhere, basically. And I think that's how you create sort of a uh, virtual set. Diversified portfolio, yeah. yeah. And, and, yeah. and, and that's, that's, that's what I want to do. How these people were here to support entrepreneurs, growth, uh, the economy of tomorrow or consolidating the economy of today depending on where you stand in the cycle can broaden that cycle to better yeah. support the portfolio companies that's 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 it's really the problem that's the primary that are, driver yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and it certainly seems to me based on conversations we've had um jb that europe does uh or the eu more broadly does a tremendous job of making it very difficult for non-EU funds to engage with EU LPs. And you're, you're, you're trying to, to basically make that easier with, with Dorian, correct? Yeah, exactly. And, and just for, for our listeners, like just to put it in perspective, I know that there are, there are a number of uh, kind of, let's say regulatory challenges, there's country specific challenges, could you just kind of summarize, you know, the challenges that that companies, uh, non-EU companies, have um, either engaging with or marketing to, or in pre-marketing to um, EU LPs that um, that Dorian helps uh, overcome? Yeah. So, other uh, uh, to give a bit more context to that, um, it is through the EU European Union is a bit of a beast. Yep. Of, of a special base because on one hand it's a supranational organization that tries to harmonize uh, law and regulation across europe mm -hmm. and yes yeah, got a sort of a social democratic tradition that is very strong and the idea of protecting okay yep. but it's not a state it's, it's got some state prerogative but it's not a state yeah and, sta and, and serving state remains at national levels so of from germany brussels and then it becomes a big ongoing negotiation Right. Uh, where you've got different philosophy, political philosophy conflicting here. The very top down, Jacobin, you know, um, uh, French approach where unity means uniformity. And some other country to whom unity does not mean uniformity. So it's, a, yep. so it's a bit of a delicate and subtle balance here. So you've got to understand Europe from a, a top down pan-European, EU-driven regulation, AFMD, the cross-border from marketing directive, but also from a bottom-up point of view, which is how countries apply national law in a way that suits their economy, their political objective, and things like that. So it's sort of a dual thing to, to understand. Yeah. And, and that is the main difficulties when you're not from Europe and, and we also country didn't understand it, that's why we had Brexit. Uh, or didn't accept it, which was one of the things that, that led to Brexit or, or to certain political uh, tensions uh, yeah. with countries like Hungary and things like that. It's mm -hmm. a very unique thing. It's a very um, bureaucratic construct. And it's funny, I was at a good friend visit party in Brussels last weekend. She worked for the European Union. Quite right. a few EU di di diplomats were there. And, and, you can, and when you speak to them, they're very bright people with grand vision. But you yeah. think from a very legal point of view it's all about legalism yeah and for other country is it's 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 very novel yeah uh, especially anglo-saxon common law driven countries so for new for a non EU gp um uh, trying to get into europe it's true that it needs to be alert and aware of what's happening from a regulatory point of view and the big things that people used to rely on was reverse solicitation that typically you would go into into such and such country, meet investor, get them to sign a letter to say, you solicited me to have this meeting, it's reverse solicitation, and I can try and demonstrate that. Uh, 
Yeah. And and this is being basically binned and 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 and, and, uh, and put to death because that's not reverse solicitation. There was organised reverse solicitation, so not what it means to be a random uh, act out of a an investor initiative without any you know contact beforehand. Uh, regulators really want to control that because they want to understand what's being raised because their yeah. worry is to fail at managing systemic risk. Uh, you may disagree or agree with the way they do, but you cannot dismiss the objective of being, you know, noble enough not to be taken uh, seriously. Yeah. And therefore, that's really uh, all these old habits um, are becoming more and more regulated as more and more people are allocated to alternative investment assets. You know, it's not before 0.5% of a portfolio, now it's then. 15% of institutional and portfolio of the line. So yeah. it's got a different weight. So it needs to be more better understood and better organized to make sure, you know, you you you, 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 you don't create um, a known risk basically. Yeah. So, I mean, to, to, to kind of summarize the challenge um, and, and most of our listeners uh, are US based funds. Um, we have, we have European listeners also, but the vast majority of listeners are, from the US. So if I'm a US fund today looking to expand my LP base to Europe uh, or to the EU, I've got a number of hurdles that I've got to overcome. You mentioned, you know, the uh, the various directives that exist out there, the yeah. challenges of reverse solicitation, which as you say is kind of going away because it's not really I mean it's an it's an almost impossible challenge for most of the funds to overcome. Um, I think you've described it in previous conversations as almost like an act of God that, um, uh, you know, yeah. if on the, on the outside chance that an LP approaches you directly, uh, you know, uh, you're okay. Um, <laughs> assuming that you get them to jump through various hoops and fi- sign various documents. Um, but outside of that, it's very difficult to engage, um, uh, in, in, in as a U.S. fund coming into Europe, unless you um, work with companies like Dorian who who can streamline that process, um, yeah. I just wonder yeah. what, what what's the appetite for uh, in in the European theatre for U.S. funds or let's say non EU funds it could be the U.K. it could be the U.S. Um, is there an appetite for it right now? Do you see that returning? So yes, I mean clearly. Uh, so, but of course, providing they comply, they do not put the allocator at risk by not complying to European regulation. Yep. Um, and, 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 you know, you asked me to summarize, but it's very difficult to summarize in a few bullet points, reverse edition, pre-marketing and things like that. But I'm happy yep. to, 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 to talk about more later. So yeah, yep. there's an appetite um, because there's a need for portfolio diversification. There's a need for GP diversification. Uh, we do know what's happening is you're asking to impact the rest of the world. So it's not something you can really dismiss or ignore in a well-balanced, well-constructed uh, asset allocation, especially with the VCP, you know, I mean, the, the, the US, about the, uh, uh, you know, big weight of the world economy. Can you really dismiss them? Can you just not be exposed to them? You could yeah. argue through correlation, Europe is going to expose, you know, is, is an indirect exposure to Western economies, but still the driver, the mammoth in the, the, in the US and and to its own specificities, it is not careful to uh, not have uh, exposure to the US. Then when you liquid portfolio, you will have exposure to the S&P 500. In your alternative portfolio, you'll have uh, exposure to the US economy, to VCMP. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I mean, I mean, appealing to, you know, Principle one hundred and one of 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 portfolio management, which is diversification, right? Uh, as, as you say, um, geographically across asset classes, um, uh, etc. So def- definitely strong drivers there. You know what what strikes me when I look at um, you know over the course of the conversations that we've had um, to date is that you've got some geographies that are that are a lot more open, a lot more willing to engage. Um, easier to navigate. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm just, I'm interested in your thoughts. I mean, for example, just this past week in, in New York, I attended a conference with Irish funds and Irish funds. Um, I mean, the, the, 
Ireland as a um, provider of services to the fund in- industry is is you know very significant. There are obviously lots of advantages, tax advantages, and, and other um, uh, you know labor related uh, benefits. Um, but but I also think it seems to be as a, a regulator a lot more open and happy to engage in you know in new initiatives. They talked actually about um, LTIF two, you know this long term investment fund. Um, proposition that came out um, a number of years ago. It kind of went it went through a false start, um, but it, 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 this next version seems to be a lot more open. Um, it's uh, lower minimums. Um, yes, there's regulation and I'm sure disclosures that come along with it, but it's designed to appeal to a broader audience and and perhaps almost to if not retail investors, then certainly to high net worth individuals and let's say a broader base of of, uh, of private capital investors. So I'm, I'm interested in your thoughts, um, JB, around uh, if you were to stack rank, and this may, might be an unfair question, but just in your own experience, the, the, the most attractive or most open markets, let's say the top five in Europe uh, to the least, you know, or, or let's say the most challenging, you know, what would, what would be kind of your most open and, and let's say top five uh, down, down to the least open for, for five uh, the most of them, clearly Luxembourg and, and Ireland. And this okay. even didn't try to be open because they want to um, make something happen in yep. Luxembourg and Dublin. So they are the most open there. The Netherlands, too, quite open too. Um, yeah, okay. And, and similar line, Netherlands try to promote their own from regulation. The Nordics remain quite open. Mm-hmm. Um, France, a bigger one, remain France and Germany in terms of total capital available. It's, it's yep. France, Germany. Uh, you know, the bigger ones. Therefore, because they've reached uh, and we work far more assets and more demanding um, yep. uh, in terms of uh, regulations and, and compliance. France is clearly the one of the purists. Uh, Germany doesn't seem as purist as France, but has these little uh, backlight tricks to make sure that German funds are not as disadvantaged against non-EU, non-German funds. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it is a highly competitive market. So I guess for, as a regulator, you've got to strike that balance between being easy to do business with, which I, I use that word kind of advisedly. Um, mm-hmm. It's all relative. Um, but at the same time, you know, protecting the interests of, of the LPs and, as you say, managing, you know, the potential for systemic risk. Um, so it's a it's a constant battle there. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. So just uh, just kind of coming back to the entrepreneurial piece for a moment here, um, you got exposed, uh, you know, through your work as a CIO. You, you, I'm sure you made investments uh, in companies and kind of sat alongside them as they grew. You grew your own businesses. Um, you've now got, uh, you know, the Dorian proposition, which you're, which you're growing. Um, what's, what's the most challenging part of, of being an entrepreneur for you, JB, um, and, and I'll come on in a moment to some of the most rewarding pieces. Right. But, but um, where, where do you see challenges? Uh, uh, you know, as a as a founder, as a CEO, um, what what presents the biggest challenges for you? I uh, so when you're an entrepreneur, you tend to be quite creative, quite a creative person. I mean, yep. you know, I guess uh, yep. and my creativity went a bit wilder uh, as being an entrepreneur. So, me and my biggest challenge that is how to channel this creativity toward one clear goal. I resist the temptation because as an entrepreneur, you see, you make connection where others do not necessarily see as being obvious. And therefore yeah. you want to do lots of things at once. Um, that is my biggest challenge. And I think that's one of the reasons why the growth of Finite was very much slowed down because we're trying to do too many things at once because first it was yeah. obvious. Uh, therefore, you know, sticking to one nine and, and one nine only on a clear positioning before trying to cross multiple chasms is my, and has been my greatest challenge. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Greatest challenge. It, it is. Uh, yeah, it is. It is interesting. As you say, when you're the founder, um, everything is possible, right? Um, and part of the challenge over time is narrowing that focus or the aperture of focus in on the things that really matter that are going to move your business forward. And in, in, in many respects, it does force you to be 
because you have restrained resources yeah. and restrained capital, you've got to really make sure that you're getting the best possible return on that. And um, there is that, yeah, that constant challenge between, on the one hand, you're an entrepreneur because you've got the creativity and you've got the drive and the enthusiasm and motivation to do things. And so yeah. your natural instinct is if you see something, you, do, you want to do something. And, um, but that has to be curbed as well, right? Because you could end up doing, you know, 10, 15 different things. And, and the point of the arrow is not as strong when, you, when it becomes, uh, you know, splintered in that way. Um, uh, clearly, yeah. clearly, 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 clearly. Yeah. And they're the big, 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 big things to really be, you know, adamantly rigorous about. Yeah, yeah. And, and what about, um, let's say on the plus side, uh, w what do you enjoy about the entrepreneurial journey or the entrepreneurial experience? I, freedom, yeah. uh, building something, trying to do something with your talents uh, that you need to serve a, a broad scope of people, uh, being mm -hmm. useful. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, I think the reason why, you know, um, uh, material things, uh, you know, uh, survivors is because yep. they're the expression of a footprint to the world, and it's not a van footprint. Um, it's part of my, you know, uh, belief system, uh, and yep. therefore what we do is here to stay for long. And yeah, I want to make it count. Yeah, yeah. It's it's interesting. Um, I I heard a a quote recently, which. You mentioned, you know, your father and your grandfather um, in their own way, being entrepreneurial, running their own businesses mm -hmm. and, and what have you. And uh, the quote referenced, you know, as we get older, um, you know, whether it's your father or so, another figure in your life that you respect, well, it can, it can kind of go one of two ways. You either spend your time trying to replicate the strengths of the person that you admire, or you spend your time working against the, the, uh -huh. the weaknesses of the people who made mistakes in the past that you do not want to replicate. Either I way, I think being an entrepreneur is kind of a mixture of both of those, right? You, yeah. Yeah. you want to achieve that success, but you also want to make sure that if you are failing, it happens quickly and you don't do it again. And um, it is a real challenge. But I guess with every experience, you know, as you, as you went through, through um, you know, the family office and Fin Life and, and now with Dorian, it gives you a, a much better perspective on what it is that you need to focus on, uh, would you say? Yeah. I, you know, uh, as I said earlier, my wife, my wife, sorry, was, was trained as a psychologist and she said <laughs> entrepreneurship was the most expensive yet most efficient, effective right. analysis ever. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I'm sure. I'm sure she's got uh, you know patient uh, privilege here, or cli client patient privilege. But um, I, it wouldn't surprise me if there was a few entrepreneurs in, in amongst her, her client base. Um, there's definitely a lot going on as you're building a business, and uh, the the swing of emotions you can experience the entire spectrum in a day. Uh, at least I, uh, that's my experience. I mean, I, I remember you know uh, you know when I went to business, you know, entrepreneurship was 42, uh, yeah. 43, and uh, full of myself, full mm -hmm. of confidence, say I know better, I've done this job, you know, many, you know, for back then, uh, 20 years, nearly 20 years. Yeah. Uh, and therefore, I know what I'm doing, and many people in financial services are very good driven, they simply believe they know better than the neighbor. Yeah. But my gosh, entrepreneurship was the most humbling journey ever. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, so it's, it's a, a very humbling experience, um, uh, JB, when uh, all of your, your mistakes are on show, your successes are on show. Um, it's, uh, it's, it just comes with the territory of being an entrepreneur. Yeah, exactly. Yes, yeah. and it's extremely humbling. And, yeah, and um, it puts things back in a row. You could argue, I mean, when you got a... Uh, when you, you discover success very early on in your career, it's very easy to be, to, 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 to measure esteem as a part of your success from between luck and, and talent. And yeah. when you only have positive feedbacks, um, it's, it's already, you know, very um, easy to, to get confused as to why you managed to get it right. 
Yeah. And, and, and when you let ego prevail, it is when you start making mistakes, you know, later. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I, I heard uh, an interview with um, NVIDIA is obviously everywhere right now. Uh, it's in the news. It's prevalent in private capital by way of investments in AI. I know you're mm -hmm. very heavily involved in that and evaluating it for, for, for some other um, family offices. Um, but uh, he made a comment at a recent uh, press conference uh, and he talked about the expression he used was, you know, they're overcoming some really significant technical challenges. And there is going to be pain and suffering in NVIDIA while they overcome these challenges. And uh, he was, it was quoted a lot on Twitter and various other social channels as a result of it, um, but actually celebrated. And what, what he meant by that, and he clarified his comments, he said that um, you, you don't really learn a great deal uh, as a result of success. You, you learn through mistakes and pain and suffering uh, it, that's what informs your character and ha and your character yeah. com comes out when you're challenged, right? And it can either be very good, it can be strong, it can be weak. And the strongest characters are those that are hewn out of um, pain and suffering in his words, but really challenges. And um, you don't really get that if you've enjoyed a privileged life of success or you've gone to an Ivy League school and, and you went from one success to the next to the next. And then suddenly you know, as many founders do, they come out of this background, try and fa found a company and fail because they're just not used to failure. They don't know how to respond to it. They don't have that character in themselves to deal with the challenges that come with being entrepreneurial. It, I just thought it definitely resonated with me. Um, that, yeah. Uh, yeah, you get and, that and humility. Just, and Josh Clooney did a very interesting reel on Instagram um, or TikTok. I can, I'm Instagram, my kids are TikTok. Yep. <laughs> and see the generational divide here. Uh, but I moved from Facebook, though, yeah? Well, <laughs> you've, got, you've got, what, what did you say four daughters and one son? Is that right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Oh, so I, I can only imagine your house is probably TikTok 24-7. Yeah, well, yes, which is the, the big fight. I mean, the big argument, the big conversation I had. Right. And, and he said, yeah, you, you grow out of failures. And that I completely agree with that. Yeah. And it is true. I mean, I'm, I'm born in the mid 70s in a quite conservative society, part of, you know, part of French society. Yeah. Um, failure was really looked, you know, looked down, you know, it was thrown yeah. upon. And, and you very fixed mindset kind of, kind of approach. And I think lots of people were, 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 were br brought up with that idea that failing was bad, failing was shameful. Yeah. But no, I mean, it's like the, uh, the image you have in the Bible is about pruning the tree. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Right. To, to encourage the growth. Yeah. I mean, the, the, um, the, the, the environment that we find ourselves in now, um, which I think is, you know, it's been a period of challenge the last couple of years, without doubt. Um, it's reverberated through the entire industry. I know credit funds have enjoyed some significant upside. AI, you know, it's been a standout. Um, but a lot of the private capital sector has been challenged. It's starting to come back. Dry powder is now being deployed by VCs. Um, you know, I was at some some um, networking events recently here in the city. And um, yeah, cutting some new checks um, you know, across a number of, of VCs and, and private equity mm -hmm. firms that I spoke to. They seem to be a lot more uh, uh, bullish is probably the wrong word, but let's say cautiously optimistic. They're getting back into it. So I'm sure we'll see that start to, to come through in Europe as well. Um, well, yeah. JB, just to, to kind of wrap up here, for people who are interested in learning more about Dorian uh, or connecting with you, um, how is it best for them to to, to reach out to you? Uh, LinkedIn. Um, yeah. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm nearly, I'm not, I wouldn't say I'm a LinkedIn addict, but I'm very often LinkedIn <laughs> multiple times an hour, every hour. Yeah. So yeah, LinkedIn is a very easy one, JB Tankere, or you can email me jb.tankere, Tankere, T-A-N-Q-U-E-R-A-Y, -E -E like the gin basically. Yeah, uh, okay. Dorian, D-O-H-Y-A-N dot E-U. Yeah. yeah, okay, perfect. Um, that's great. Well, I encourage people to, to reach out to you. Um, Thank you. It's been, it's been great speaking to you, JB. Um, I wish you nothing but success with Dorian. Obviously, delighted to have you as a, as a client. And um, hope we have a, a long and fruitful relationship. Um, but uh, yes, encourage everybody to, to reach out to JB um, to, to learn more. 
We'll also, on our website uh, at assetclass.com, be providing a link to uh, some webinars that we ran recently with JB, which kind of talk in more detail about some of the, let's say, the regulatory points that we brought up in this conversation. So hopefully you'll find that useful as well. But for today, JB, thank you very much for your time, for joining us here on the People of Private Capital podcast. And the very best of luck to you. Thanks, JB. Thank you very much for having me. Have a lovely day. Keep well. Thank you. You too. Bye. Cheers.